Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Give me Jesus, Lord. Give me Jesus. You can have all the rest. Just give me Jesus. Amen. Over the years, I have learned a lot of lessons about life. Such as, sometimes our worst days can actually turn out to be our best days. Sometimes a setback can turn into a stepping stone to spiritual maturity. Sometimes a moment of, of painful failure can be transformed by God's grace into a harbinger of glory. Sometimes when we feel the lowest in life, that is when God draws near us to us. Sometimes our worst days turn out to be our very best days. Sometimes they bring us to our senses, or best of all, they bring us to our knees. And this is what we see in this story that is told by Jesus. We know it as the uh, parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And like all of these stories, these parables that Jesus told, it has a unique twist to it. And the twist to this story is that the underdog comes out on top. There are two central characters in this story. The top dog is the Pharisee. He's a religious man, you know, and you look at him and he's got it all together. He's got it all going on. You know, he's kind of Standing up really straight with his chest out, he's kind of all puffed up. So he's got it going. But the underdog is the tax collector. And he is, is feeling really low and lost and worn. There are some people who believe that because he's a tax collector who were the most hated people in the land, that he shouldn't even be allowed to go into the temple. And so here is this man who is really feeling lost. And Jesus says that these two men go in the temple to pray. And the Pharisee, who's got it all going going on in life, and, you know, he's really self-assured, he just walks right in. After all, he's very familiar to it. This is, this is like his second home, the temple, and he just walks right into this place of prominence there in the temple. And he looks up to God and he says to God, Oh, God, I thank you that I am not as other men extortioners, unjust, and even as this tax collector. But the tax collector, barely inside the temple, feeling so unworthy, he is there and he's on his knees and he's beating on his chest in such a state of, of grief and despair and personal anguish. And he can barely get the words out. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now notice, please, the contrast that Jesus has drawn between these two. The Pharisee walks into the temple all full of himself. 
It's like, hey, look at me. Look at me. See that I've got it going. But he walked away from the temple, condemned by God. The tax collector is experiencing the worst day of his life. But that day turns out to be the best day of his life. Because as he leaves the temple, he is blessed by God and has come into a loving connection with God. Now this, I love this parable. I think I've preached on this parable a thousand times. Well, I haven't preached that much. But I've preached on it a good number of times. So I had my choice of which one of these sermons I wanted to preach today. But there are a couple of real deep insights from it that I want to remind you of this morning. The first insight is this. Arrogance is destructive. Arrogance is destructive. The Pharisee was so focused on himself that he has become, for all practical purpose, purposes now, the poster child for arrogant pride. It's interesting, as we take a look at this prayer that this Pharisee makes, that he mentions God one time. One time, but he mentions himself five times. That kind of gives you a hint, doesn't it? Gives you a clue. Arrogant pride. Uh, when, when I was growing up, and probably many of you uh, out there as well, there were these uh, wonderful fables called Aesop's Fables. You remember those? And they were these wonderful little stories, like you know, a lot like parables. And they had a, a great moral embedded in them. One of my favorites was the mice and the weasels. And in this, in this uh, fable, the mice and the weasels are constantly at war. They're always fighting each other. And the mice are always losing. Mice never win. And so they decide that they need to have a, a meeting. This is the way Methodists are. If something's not going right, we've got to have a meeting. And we have to form a committee to kind of figure it out. Right? That's how we work. And so they decided to have this meeting, this, this church-wide gathering of the mice. To figure out what's going wrong. Why is it that we always lose to the weasels? And one of the mice speaks up and he says, well, you know, we just aren't organized. That's the problem. We don't have any organization. We never know what to do. So there, that's a problem. And they kind of shook their heads on that. And then another one spoke up and said, no, those weasels don't fight fair. They, they don't fight the way they should. And they kind of nodded at that. And then a third third mouse spoke up and said, it's because we don't have any leaders. No leaders among us to tell us what to do and how we should respond. And so they thought, well, that's a really good idea because we can do something about that right now. And so they appointed certain leaders from among them. And now they thought that this was, they, they've got the answer. The only problem is that these leaders now get a sense of self-importance. You know, they've got a position of power and authority. And so they decide that they've got to be seen for their importance. And so they had these coats made that had all these medals pinned on them. These heavy medals pinned on them. And more so, they had these hats with horns, big long horns sticking out of them. They put those on their heads so everybody could see them and know this is a person of importance. Well, there's a fight with the weasels. And once again, the mice get routed. 
most of them are able to make it back to the escape holes. But those leaders, those what they call the commanders, the commanders didn't make it. Because the heavy metals weighed them down and they couldn't get into the escape holes because of those horned hats that they had on. And the weasels came and ate every single one of them. Now, what's the moral to the story? Anybody want to venture a guess? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be a leader. Okay, I'm I'm just going to say the benediction and we're going to we're going to just go right on home from here now. What it says is that vanity costs more than it's worth, right? And it says that arrogant pride is destructive. Now let me ask you. Are you feeling a little bit uh puffed up? a little prideful, like you've got it all going on? Are you feeling really important? Stop it. Just zip it. Remember, the old proverb is right. Pride goes before the fall. And I want you to write this down and remember it. The closer we get to God the more gracious, the more humble we become. Do you hear that? The closer we get to God, the more gracious and humble we become. You see, those, that proud, arrogant Pharisee with his chest all puffed up and being there in the center of the temple for everybody to see, says, hey, look at me. See how important I am. And he left the temple that day condemned. Condemned by God. But that humble tax collector, beating his chest in anguish, prays for, in humility, for God's help. And he leaves the temple blessed by God. There's a second insight. Ingratitude. Ingratitude is unattractive. Ingratitude is unattractive. The Pharisee starts off all, all right. He begins his prayer and he says, Oh God, I thank you. That's a, that's a good start. Sounds like he's heading right down the right road in the right direction, but then he keeps speaking. If he just shut up there, that would have been okay. But he keeps on speaking, and as we read this prayer, we see that it is a pretty ugly prayer. It's a, a very haughty uh, prayer that he is making, a self-congratulatory prayer. It is... An unattractive prayer because it doesn't have a bit of gratitude or thankfulness to God in it whatsoever. Some years ago, there was a professor, a theology professor at the University of Boston named uh, Dr. William Steegers. And one day he was thinking back on his life, and he was thinking back on uh, all these people who had contributed to, to who he was, to his character, to his, uh, what he had become in life, his success in life. And the more he began to think about it, the more faces began to appear in his imagination. And one face in particular was the face of his of his elementary school teach, uh, teacher. She had been such a powerful influence on him, guided him along and followed his progress all the way through 
school. And the more he thought about her, the more he thought, I need to write her and thank her. So he sat down and he wrote her a letter telling her what she had meant to him in his life. I want to read to you in her words what she wrote back to Dr. Steigers. My dear Willie, I cannot tell you how much your note meant to me. I am in my late 80s now, living all alone in a small room, cooking my own meals. Lonely, like the last leaf of autumn lingering behind. You'll be interested to know that I taught school for 50 years. And yours is the first note of appreciation I ever received. It came on a blue cold morning and cheered me as nothing has in years. Having gotten that response, he, he began to think of others who had been important to him. And he thought about a bishop who had been very helpful to him as he uh, went through his ordination and uh, he took his appointments before he became a professor at the theology school. This bishop was retired now and he had just recently lost his wife. So Dr. Steigers wrote him a thank you note. And this was the bishop's response to that note. My dear Willie, your letter was so beautiful, so real, that as I sat reading it in my study, tears fell from my eyes, tears of gratitude. And then before I realized what I was doing, I rose from my chair and called my wife's name to show it to her, forgetting for a moment that she was gone. You will never know how much your letter has warmed my spirit. I have been walking about in the glow of it all day long. Let me ask you something. Are there people in your life, people that you know, who are still living, who were such inspirations to you, who had helped to bless your life in some important way. Isn't today the day you need to write them a letter or an email to tell them what they mean to you? It's great to receive a letter of gratitude. But it's even better to give it, to share it, to write it. Mark this down. The closer we get to God, the more grateful we become. And then uh, one other. It's tucked away in it. That is, criticism is corrosive. Criticism is corrosive. The Pharisee exalts himself by putting down the tax collector. Do you remember that in the story? And it boomeranged on him. And that's the way it always works. Bad-mouthing always boomerangs. Whenever we try to make ourselves look good by putting somebody else down, try, trying to make them look bad, that always comes back at us and smacks us right upside the head. When we bash or trash other people, guaranteed, it's going to come back and bite you. Bad-mouthing 
always boomerangs. Rod Wilmot tells a, a cute little story <coughs> about this fellow who's walking in the mall. And um, he's looking at the window displays in the, uh, there in the stores there in the mall. And he notices, he notices across the way, there's this little boy, just a young little boy. And he's walking along, he's looking in the windows himself, but he doesn't have any adult with him. No parent, no adult, nobody with him. And he looks way too young, way too young to be by himself without an adult. And so he decides he's going to go over there and make sure he's okay. And so he walks over to where this little boy is. And then, as he's getting close to the little boy, over the loudspeaker comes the announcement. Would Christopher Walker please go to the big clock in the center of the mall? Well, the guy continues over. But when he gets closer to the little boy, he hears the little boy saying under his breath, Darn it, I must be lost again. And that, you know, obviously little Christopher had wandered off before. And that can happen to us. We can get lost as well. Along our faith journey, we can get lost. We wander away from the spirit of love and grace and kindness and forgiveness. We wind up getting lost because we have lost the spirit of Jesus. We have lost the spirit of Jesus. You know, on that day in the temple... If Jesus had been there in that temple, he would never have looked down on that tax collector. He would never have looked down on him. He, he would never have sneered at the man or criticized at him or pointed his finger at him like the Pharisee did. But instead, he would have gone over there and put his arms around the shoulder of this broken, distraught man. And he would ask him, you know, how can I help you? And that's what Jesus wants us to do, literally, figuratively, for the broken and the hurting in our community. To put our arms around them. And to say, how can I help you in the spirit of Jesus Christ? Let me ask you something. Have you been letting your tongue a little too loose? Have you tried to bring yourself up by putting somebody else down? Then quit. Somebody said that, you know, when we point the finger at someone, there are three other fingers pointing right back at us. Mark this down. The closer we become to God, the more gentle we become. The Pharisee tried to build himself up by taking a verbal pop shot, shot at the tax collector. I thank you, O oh God, that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, and even as this tax collector. And he left the temple condemned, condemned by God. But the tax collector prayed for God's grace and forgiveness as a sinner. And he walked away blessed. It's a great story, isn't it? It's a wonderful uh, parable. The next three Sundays I'll be preaching it over and over again a different, with different insights into it. 
You know, um, some Decembers ago, Decembers ago, I got a Christmas card from a really good friend. And I loved uh, the personal note that they wrote in the card. But I really loved the message on the card. And this was the message on the card. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, then God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. And so God sent us a Savior. The tax collector prayed, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That prayer is for all of us. All of us. For our greatest need is forgiveness. So God sent us a Savior. And if you commit yourself to that, and remember that in your heart, then it's going to be Christmas every single day. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this, um, this day, for this opportunity to be here, to worship, for the wonderful insights that we can gain from these parables of Jesus and how they still speak to us relevant uh, truths today if we simply open our hearts to receive them and to be blessed by them. Lord, our greatest need is forgiveness. Not just for the things that we have done, but forgiveness for ourselves for how we feel about ourselves, not trusting in your grace and your unconditional love for us. So, Lord, let Jesus be alive in us. Help us to be set free from these things that bind us in life and enslave us. Help us to live in the spirit of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.